Welcome everyone. Um, my name is Matt Lacerdo. I am the director of the Affinity and Domestic um, Programming here in the Alumni Office at Northeastern. Uh, I just wanted to welcome everyone for this great event. Um, as you know, we have a wonderful speaker, Professor Meg Heckman, um, and she'll be giving a presentation for you. Just for some general ground rules for the event, um, if you have any questions for the professor, please type them into the chat function. I'll make sure to um, ask the questions to the professor so we can get them over to her. Um, and then just so everyone knows, if you want, make sure to put your view in speaker uh, mode. So you'll have uh, the professor basically right there because I know you probably don't want to see my face uh, during this presentation. Uh, and feel free to keep yourself muted and your cameras off during the presentation. Um, we will have some slides and things like that that will be able to be shared with everyone um, and the professor will do that. Uh, so without further ado, let me do a quick introduction of Professor Meg Heckman um, is a journalist, author and educator focused on building news ecosystems that uh, that is robust, diverse and equipped to serve all segments of the society. She is an assistant professor of journalism and a faculty affiliate uh, of the NU labs uh, for text and maps and works. Uh, Meg writes regularly for a variety of publications about the intersection of gender technology and journalism with a special focus on experiences of the female editors and publishers. Her methods include archival research, oral history, text analysis, and plenty of shoe leather reporting. She often collaborates with technologists, designers, entrepreneurs, and other journalists, as well as scholars from the digital humanities, gender studies, and sociology and data science. I think I kind of hit some of the things, but I know Meg wants to probably introduce herself a little bit better than I can. So Meg, feel free to take it away. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much, Matt, for that nice introduction and for inviting me to do this tonight. Um, and thank you to everybody who um, is joining us. Um, if those of you are on the East Coast, particularly the Northeast, it's kind of a cold and rainy night. So I hope you have some snacks, cup of cocoa, beverage of your choice, um, and you can just settle in. And we're going to have a discussion about um, how local news organizations can influence national politics. If you give me just a moment, I am going to share my screen. <clears throat> I also want to apologize. I have been teaching both on Zoom and in our hybrid classrooms all week. Lecturing through a mask um, is a little exhausting on my vocal cords. So if my voice cuts out, um, I do apologize. I have some tea here and I'm going to try and um, muster through. OK, can everyone see those slides? Okay, great. Um, all right. So before we dive in to the main topic of the evening, um, Matt hit on a lot of the highlights, but I just want to tell you a little bit about me. Um, I worked for a little more than a decade as a full-time journalist, mostly in newspapers, mostly in New Hampshire. Um, I worked for a newspaper called uh, the Concord Monitor, which is the, the capital city newspaper in New Hampshire. And then I did some digital strategy work for its parent company. Um, and around the same time was invited to teach some journalism classes and writing workshops and just fell in love with working with students um, and emerging journalists. And so I quit a perfectly good job in my early thirties and went back to grad school at Northeastern um, to do my graduate work so I could become um, a professor. So I have degrees from the University of New Hampshire and Northeastern. Um, when it comes to college hockey, I don't know if I should be saying this um, at an alumni network event, but when it comes to hockey, I, I do root for UNH still, but baseball, it's all about Northeastern. Um, and I am a faculty affiliate of the new lab for texts, maps, and networks. That's going to come up later on when I tell you a little bit about some of the big data text analysis that I did to, to investigate the, the editor and publisher that I'm going to talk about later on. Um, and I'm also a member of the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies Executive Committee, which is a wonderful interdisciplinary organization at Northeastern that just does some really incredible work. Um, Matt hit on where I do most of my writing and research. Um, and I'm an advocate for accurate, sustainable, and inclusive news. And I can talk more about what all of those things mean later on in the evening. So um, before we dive in to talking about the relationship between local news organizations and national politics, I want us to just talk very briefly 
about this idea of a news ecosystem. So uh, a lot of us think about news as information that we consume from a handful of sources. Um, so maybe we have a favorite local television station or a favorite local newspaper or a favorite blog. And that's where we go to get the bulk of our information. But none of those publications, none of those news outlets exist in a vacuum. And so the information that we consume, the news that we consume is part of an interdependent ecosystem, a, a network where uh, a story in one place can inform or debunk a story in another place. And this has always been true, but with the rise of digital publishing, we are seeing this type of, of interplay and interconnectedness happen faster and, um, and in ways that we had never really thought about before. But this interconnectedness has very much um, been around long before digital, um, long before the advent of, of digital publishing. And I'm gonna give you an example of that right now. So um, we're gonna talk about um, a newspaper, a very unusual newspaper called the Manchester New Hampshire Union Leader. And um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with um, New Hampshire geography, Manchester is its largest city. Um, it's probably a 45 minute drive north of Boston if you don't hit traffic, um, straight up 93. Um, it's a fairly sizable city. It, it, is, um, it used to be the home of one of the biggest textile um, production facilities in the world. Um, so it's kind of been reinventing itself ever since the loss of the textile industry. Um, and it is also the home of a highly unusual newspaper called The Union Leader uh, that's been publishing since the first part of the 20th century. And um, because New Hampshire is home to the first in the nation primary, the union leader has taken on historically an outsized role in national politics. Um, and that's because as the state's only statewide newspaper, it exerts a tremendous amount of, in, or it used to exert a tremendous amount of influence on um, the likelihood of a candidate's success in any statewide election, um, including the presidential primaries. And this was largely because of the efforts of um, a couple of people named William and Naki Loeb. Um, and I can't see you all. So if I were doing this in person, I would ask how many of you had heard of William Loeb. Um, actually, let me see if I can see people. Um, okay. So just really quickly in the chat, um, how many, has anybody heard of William Loeb? No? Okay. So William Loeb um, was this uh, very um, kind of flamboyant, over the top um, character. He was a newspaper publisher, um, arch conservative, and he used front page editorials to exert tremendous influence on conservative politics. Um, and he was this larger than life figure. He was um, feared and hated by um, people who opposed his conservative views and venerated by people who shared them. Um, and when it came to the national media, so because again, there's that ecosystem, because the New Hampshire primary is such a big deal, every four years, national reporters from all over the country would descend upon New Hampshire. And William Loeb made for a great story. He packed guns, he rode horses, he had two mansions. Um, his, his father had been Teddy Roosevelt, Secretary of State, and Teddy Roosevelt was his godfather, so he was like low-key famous. Um, his personal life was a mess. Naki Loeb, the woman I wrote about, was his third wife, and he'd been through these two really salacious divorces. So the guy made for a great story. And as a result, there was kind of this legend of William Loeb that grew up around the New Hampshire primary. Um, and it was told and retold over and over again, except 
that legend left out a very, very important figure, a very, very important player. And that was his wife, Naki Scripps-Loeb, who you can see in this picture right here. Um, this was in the 1960s, one of um, five or six trips she made to various president's White Houses over the years as an honored guest. Um, and she is shaking hands with Richard Nixon right there. So Naki was the granddaughter of newspaper baron E.W. Scripps. And she grew up in a family obsessed with newspapers. Um, E.W. liked to work remotely, as did her father, who took over the company after him. So when she was at home just being a kid, the entire house would be packed with newspaper executives trying to figure out the business. So she kind of learned the newspaper business by osmosis um, and wanted nothing to do with it. So she eloped with a much older man um, during World War II, moved to his fancy schmancy farm in Vermont, um, and then almost immediately began secretly dating a, a newspaper publisher, William Loeb. Um, and at that time, he owned a couple of newspapers in um, Vermont and was in the process of expanding into New Hampshire. And that was happening right around the same time the first in the nation primary was really gaining significance. So this combination of, of her newspaper business sense, her intense conservative ideology, and the Loeb's location in the home of the first in the nation primary allowed them to turn the union leader, a local newspaper, into this conservative powerhouse for most of the second half of the 20th century. It vaulted the two of them to national political prominence. Um, they were kind of this conservative power couple. And it also meant that they were um, part of a, a group of early kind of first generation right wing media owners who helped define the contours of what eventually became what we know as the conservative movement. Um, and Naki did this in a variety of ways, both before William Loeb's death, when she was working as his mostly silent business partner, um, and after William Loeb's death, when she took over as president and publisher of the Union Leader Corporation. And I'm gonna show you an example of how she talked about that work. So um, William and Naki Loeb, their main way of communicating with their audiences was front page editorials. His were far too long for my tastes and like way over the top rhetorically. She tended to write a little shorter because she was a talented artist. She also did a lot of cartoons um, political cartoons, and she was very, very clear about the audiences that she was serving. So the day after William Loeb died, she published this very prominent front page editorial. I mean, they still hadn't planned the guy's funeral, and she was like back in the office writing this editorial, um, where she was promising that the union leader was going to remain a force in conservative politics. So this was a um, little more than a year into Reagan's first term. Um, they viewed getting Reagan reelected as absolutely crucial to the conservative movement. They saw his initial election as a huge victory. Um, and they were really trying to, to make hay from, from that achievement, from getting him into the White House. Um, and so she was very concerned that the conservative movement might lose traction and the union leader might lose traction because when she took over, there was a tremendous amount of sexism. She faced um, very dismissive coverage in, in a variety of news organizations at both the local and the national level, you know, basically saying there's no way this woman could possibly run a newspaper. Um, and of course, those statements completely ignored the fact that she had been running the newspaper for many decades before, just in the background, um, while William Loeb was the public face. So Naki writes this editorial, and you can see my emphasis down here in the lower right hand corner. Um, she is vowing that the paper will serve the people of New Hampshire and the citizens of this country. And that's incredibly important because the union leader served two audiences in this very unique way for a local paper. I've got a slide here that's going to help us understand 
those two different audiences. So one was local to New Hampshire and the other was ideological. So the audience that is local to New Hampshire subscribed to the union leader for the reason that all of us seek local news sources, right? We want to know what's going on in our shared geographic space. If you live in Boston, you want to know what's going on in Boston. You might want to know some, you might want something even more granular. So for those of you who are tuning in from the Northeastern campus, because I did see some students' names on the sign up sheet, um, if you want to know what's going on in your neighborhoods, you might pick up a copy of the Fenway News. Or um, you know, if you live out in Dorchester, you're picking up a copy of the Dorchester Reporter or reading it online because it is a publication that is about everything that's happening in a specific geographic space that matters to you. So there were a lot of people from New Hampshire who subscribed to the union leader because they needed to know what was going on in New Hampshire and the union leader was the statewide newspaper. Um, and these people view, viewed the union leader the same way that any one of us views a local news source. Maybe they loved the paper's editorial stance, maybe they hated it, but it was a good place to go to find out if your kid's soccer team had won or lost, maybe clip out a picture of your kid playing soccer to send to the grandparents, um, find out you know, what was going on at your police department, what the school board had voted on, what the town council had voted on. Every once in a while, there'd be a great investigative story in the summers, there would be these wonderful um, kind of slice of life feature stories about agricultural fairs. Um, at one point in the early 80s, there was this absolutely hilarious front page story about a 500 pound pig that escaped and ran around downtown Manchester and like half the police department had to come out and catch the pig. So it was really a local newspaper in a lot of different ways. And these people, they were incredibly loyal subscribers and they helped make the paper a financial success. So the union leaders news operation really satisfied that local audience. Then there was this other audience and this was where Mackey's ideological power really came from. Um, this audience stretched way far beyond the Granite State's borders, like just across the country. Um, and sometimes internationally, these people tended to subscribe to the union leader by mail. And during Mackey's tenure as publisher, their numbers grew tremendously because Mackey was able to leverage emerging communication technology like C-SPAN and other forms of cable news to turn herself into kind of this proto TV political commentator. And so every time she would appear on C-SPAN to talk about the New Hampshire presidential primary or other aspects of New Hampshire politics that were of interest to a national audience, um, the union leader would receive fan mail. She would receive fan mail. All of these letters addressed to dear Mrs. Loeb, I agree with you 100%. Here's a check. I want to get your newspaper by mail for the next year. And so this would happen a few times a year. And, and this, um, this kind of shared political ideology, shared conservative ideology bound together the, the union leaders national audience. And they were completely and totally devoted to Naki Loeb. You know, people thought that William Loeb was over the top, kind of fascinating, um, you know, maybe a little, um, maybe a little out there. But Naki, for whatever reason, you know, she just was not what anyone would think of as a conservative power player at that time. You know, she was kind of petite. Um, she was uh, she was actually um, privately quite an introvert. She didn't love going on television, but she did it because she thought it was good for the movement. Um, in an she'd been in a terrible Jeep accident during the late 1970s and so was paralyzed from the chest down and had to use a wheelchair for the rest of her life. So she was a rare woman in, in a very masculine space um, in the 80s and 90s. And she was a rare person with a disability in, in a space and time when people with disabilities were still very much 
not part of the public sphere. Um, and so as a result, you know, she was, pe people were really fascinated by her and her backstory and also her ideology. And so she had this fan base. Um, and as I said, that audience grew much longer during her time as publisher. Um, and just to give you a sense of, of what that meant, how she was able to leverage those audiences um, to help her spread her message, I'm going to give you two examples. One from before William Loeb became publisher. And I mean, I'm sorry, one from before William Loeb died um, and one from after she became publisher. Before I do that though, I wanna pause and see if there are any questions because I just threw a ton of information at you. So Matt, are there any questions? Um, we haven't had any questions yet, but we'll give a, a minute or two or a couple seconds to let people type something Perfect. in if they have any questions. Yeah. All right. I don't okay, think we have any questions, so we'll, will we'll keep on going. I'll put the screen share back on. Okay, um, so the first example that I'm going to show you of how um, Naki was able to really leverage um, her audience to, to spread her, her conservative ideology is rooted in um, efforts to desegregate public schools in the 1950s. And here's where I just wanna pause for a minute and, and um, just be really clear that while I spent a lot of time investigating and researching Naki Loeb's life and career and her impact and her legacy, um, I do not endorse all of her viewpoints. Um, in fact, I find a number of the stances that she took throughout her life incredibly problematic, um, particularly the ones that relate to um, structural racism and um, the LGBT community. Uh, she was on the wrong side of history on those things. Um, and I think um, her unwillingness or inability to evolve, um, particularly as um, attitudes towards the LGBT community in New Hampshire became much more progressive during the 1990s um, really hurt some people. And so I just want to acknowledge that. Um, so just because I am exploring her impact, I am not endorsing all aspects of her ideology. Um, but I do think that her life and her work is um, an important case study in the role of conservative media in, in building the contours of our modern um, political landscape and also the role of women, most of them white, Christian and wealthy in um, kind of reinforcing um, patriarchal systems and, and white patriarchal systems, especially. So um, now that I've talked about that, um, the example that I'm going to show you. So this was um, a cartoon that Naki drew for the front page of the union leader um, around the time that um, the, the, um, the National Guard had been sent in to protect the, the small group of black teenagers who were trying to integrate Little Rock High School in Arkansas. And they faced violent mobs. They were threatened with lynching, um, all for trying to do what a Supreme Court decision had told them they had the right to do. And that was a right to um, equal education regardless of the color of their skin. Um, and so these young people were faced with, with threats of lynching. And so the, the president sent in the national guard to protect them. And this infuriated, um, segregationists mostly in the South, but they also had the support of key figures in the conservative movement in other parts of the country, including Naki and William Loeb. And so William Loeb wrote this, um, editorial, um, just decrying the use of, of federal force um, and saying that states needed to make decisions about this. And Naki drew this cartoon to go with it. 
And I am going to show you that this cartoon went what we would call viral um, in a very analog world. So here is, um, here is, this is Arkansas Governor um, Orville Faubus. And he is holding up, he is in Arkansas where this picture was taken. And he is holding up the front page of the Union Leader that has this cartoon on it. So the Loeb's and their allies were, were savvy enough to make sure that copies of their newspaper were rush shipped, rush delivered to key conservative figures throughout the rest of the country. And so that meant that the work that they had done, in this case, the work that Naki had done, um, was <clears throat> in the national consciousness very quickly. So this photo of, um, of Fabus was went out on the national wires. It went out on the Associated Press. It ran, um, I found it in at least 20 newspapers across the country the day or two after um, the cartoon ran and the day or two after um, the, the standoff in Little Rock. So this image was very much seared into the conservative consciousness. Um, so much that it continued to appear in flyers, on posters, and on bumper stickers in the South. Um, this is, you can see the, a version of the cartoon right there. And um, this was on a town hall door somewhere in the South in the 1960s. So almost a decade later, this image was still quite common. And you can't see it right there because um, this is a pretty small photo, but Naki Loeb's name was underneath it. So because of stuff like this, and there were a few other examples, you know, she thought Joe McCarthy was great um, and everybody else was out to get him. Um, and there were a few other examples where her name was attached to these kind of iconic um, moments in, in the conservative movement. And so as a result, she was a pretty known quantity even before her husband's death. Um, and after he died, she was able to cultivate this incredible network, a, a, um, an analog social network. And this is a passage from my book that talks about how activists on the far right and the far left used this interesting analog mashup of um, newsletters, pamphlets, and zines. And for those of you who are not familiar with zines, zines were like uh, cheap, quickly produced magazines that you would maybe plaster all over um, bulletin boards or kind of stuff under your neighbor's doors, or they would go out to a specific community. So they were kind of like blogs, but on paper. Um, and these kinds of um, publications were absolutely crucial to the rights resurgence at the end of the 20th century. And Naki, because of her position in the movement and her position in the union leader, she became a node in this analog network. And that gave her a tremendous amount of power. And conservative activists from all over the country really saw her union leader as a clearinghouse in an information ecosystem that they believed was biased against them. So when we get back to that idea of a news ecosystem that we were talking about before, this is an example of how um, one publication can have an outsized role in amplifying um, a certain population's voices. Um, and amplifying uh, a certain ideology's views far beyond geographic borders. Okay, I'm gonna skip that. Um, and just so you get a sense of the amount of mail that she got, uh, this was about half of her private archive that I had access to while I was researching the book. And all of these boxes are absolutely stuffed with letters that she received and copies of the letters that she sent back. So it didn't matter if you were, you know, a, a super famous member of com Congress or just a rank and file conservative activist. If you wrote to Naki Loeb, she was gonna write you back. 
And if you had something interesting to pass along, she might publish it in the union leader so other conservatives could see it. And sometimes she would act as an intermediary between powerful members of the conservative movement and rank and file conservatives. So she would kind of play matchmaker between um, elected officials and rank and file activists that she thought might be useful. Meg, we have a couple of quick questions. Oh, sure, yeah, audience. absolutely. Let me stop the screen share. Uh, so the first question we had was just out of curiosity, how much did printing um, out the cartoon cost um, paper? I'm sorry, what? It, the cartoon? that they did, how much did that co cost the paper printing it out and sending it around? Did oh you gosh. by any chance get that? I don't know. Um, you know, I would imagine, um, I mean, the 1950s, I mean, newsprint wasn't cheap, um, mm -hmm. but I think what they would do is they would just print copies of the union leader and send the whole union leader two key figures in the movement. Um, but no, I wasn't able to find any bookkeeping on that, but that would have been interesting. Um, <laughs> what I was able to find um, in the 1980s, late 1980s, so um, kind of the run up to um, the 1988 election cycle, Naki created what she called the union leader reader. And so it was a once a month um, tab so it was about the size of letter paper and you know 15 20 pages and it was an aggregation of all of the union leaders opinion content for the month and she would send that to at least a thousand maybe more than that key members of the movement people in congress rank and file readers um and she didn't charge for it she gave it away for free and um, people I talked to who used to work for her were like, we don't know why, you know, she was a really savvy businesswoman and she cared that much about getting the message out that she just kind of gave that away. So I think they were willing to do that. And then uh, the, the other question that we had that kind of uh, came out is, is there any comparison to Mackey as in, is there someone a close second to, to her uh, or someone similar in the industry currently um, that you would see? So I think, like, no. <laughs> um, and I, I tried because, you know, when you're, when you're writing someone's biography, you want to contextualize them. Um, and she was just a really, really unique figure. I mean, I think that's part of the reason why there was enough for a book. But, you know, if you look at other prominent conservative female newspaper publishers, there aren't many of them. Um, the one that comes to mind is Sissy Patterson. Um, and she was part of the Patterson Medill newspaper family. And she purchased, um, I believe it was a, a, oh gosh, I am, I can look it up. It's, I want to say the Washington Times, but that wasn't what it was. It was a competitor. To, it was a Washington newspaper. Um, she bought it from Hearst, I believe. And she was, um, this was pre-World War II. So it was a different type of conservatism. Um, she's pretty isolationist. Um, she was accused of being pro-Nazi. I don't know enough about the, yes, Molly just put, yes, the Washington Times Herald, thank you. Um, and so, you know, there's that comparison. I, you know, it would be, it would be inaccurate to try and compare her to any um, modern conservative commentators. I, you know, there's a, there's a, conservative website these days called The Federalist mm -hmm. that has um, a high concentration of, of women working for it. You know, there's a, a higher concentration than a lot of other um, news publications, regardless of ideology or mission. Um, and I often thought that if Naki were alive today, you know, maybe she'd be doing something like that. But the, the news landscape is so different that it's hard to make comparisons, but that's a good question. Okay. Yeah, those are the questions we have right now. So All right, great. We're going to dive back in and I'm going to mm -hmm. get through, I'm going to get us through to modern day and then we'll take some more questions. Um, oh, sharing my screen again would be helpful. Okay. Um, so this incredibly devoted audience that Naki was able to amass gave her a tremendous amount of power. And she 
cashed in on that hard in the run-up to the 1992 presidential primary. So just to set the stage, um, some of us, 1992 was a very long time ago. And for some of us on the call, I suspect you might not have been born in 1992, which is totally fine. So um, just to give you a recap, after Ronald Reagan finished up his two terms in 1998, um, there was a kind of some soul searching in the conservative movement. Um, leaders in the movement, including Naki, were attempting to find uh, a torchbearer for, for the Reagan legacy, you know, kind of the next Reagan, their, their next image of conservatism. And um, the, the conservative favorite candidate who emerged was a guy named Jack Kemp, um, who I guess was a very smart guy, but by all accounts, a really terrible campaigner. Um, and Naki couldn't stand him. Um, and he didn't seem to understand that he really needed to, to woo the union leader and Naki to, to do well in New Hampshire. So um, his campaign didn't, didn't do very well. She tried for a little while to recruit a woman named Jean Kirkpatrick, who was an ambassador to the, who had been an ambassador to the, um, to the United Nations, was a fairly well-known and respected uh, political scientist. Kirkpatrick declined. George Bush, who Naki viewed as far too moderate and everything that was wrong with the Republican Party, um, he, he ultimately won the nomination and the presidency. And this photo that I have here was at a dinner um, in honor of William Loeb and her late husband and the union leader. And um, George Bush, then the vice president, spoke at it to try and curry favor with the Loeb's. And she just gave this incredibly biting speech. Um, and she's holding up a copy of the union leader over her head like it's a battle flag for all the conservatives in the room. So it was pretty apparent, even though he won in 88, that um, Naki and her, um, her colleagues in, in that part of the movement um, were not okay with him. And almost immediately they started looking around for someone to challenge him in the 1992 um, New Hampshire primary. You know, maybe not to beat him, but to scare him farther to the right. And the person that Naki picked was um, Patrick Buchanan, who's still quite active in, in conservative politics today. He was a former speechwriter um, for Nixon. He had known the Loeb's for years. Um, he was probably at the White House when that picture of Naki shaking hands with Nixon was taken. Um, and he was a conservative columnist. The union leader reprinted his syndicated column and would sometimes commission special columns from him just for their audience. Um, and so Naki kept convincing him to run. She kept calling him. She didn't let up. And, um, you know, the fact that the union leader had endorsed Buchanan in the 92 primary was pretty well known. What was not known until I started doing research for this book and was actually able to, to get an interview with Pat Buchanan, I spent a couple hours in his living room in suburban, um, in suburban DC a couple summers ago. He's very gracious, um, has just lived a fascinating life. He told me repeatedly that if he had not known that he was going to have the support of Naki Loeb and the union leader in 92, he never would have tried to run. So um, Buchanan did not win that year, not in New Hampshire and certainly not nationally. Um, but he almost beat Bush in New Hampshire. It was enough to really kind of put the Bush campaign on its heels, probably didn't help the Bush campaign in the general election. Um, and Buchanan's success in New Hampshire also got him to the 1992 Republican convention where he gave this really famous um, fiery speech um, that's often called the culture war speech. Um, it was very, um, it, was, it, it was just all about social issues and kind of laying out many of the, the things that continue to divide um, our country today. And he was clearly saying that this is the way forward for the conservative movement and really reshaped um, 
Republican politics in a way that still echoes today. Um, and he continued to say for the rest of Naki's life that um, the conservative movement would not be where it is had it not been for the contributions of Naki Loeb and the union leader. Um, and he, this is a quote from Naki's funeral in 2000. Um, she died a couple of weeks before the primary that year. But when I talked to him as recently as two years ago, he continued to say that. He continued to say that you know her work, he could really see um, the echoes of her work and her legacy in the modern political landscape. Um, so this is, <clears throat> and if you want to know more about any of that, this is a shameless plug for my book. Um, and that case study that I just told you about is a very clear example of how one local news organization really impacted national politics and national policy for decades um, in ways that we're still just understanding now. So I now want to spend before I actually, do we have questions before I go into the modern political landscape? Um, I don't have anything in the chat box yet. Okay, um, great. If you want to go for it, I'll ask uh, if someone does type in. Perfect. Yeah, you can just go ahead and interrupt me. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the news ecosystem today is really, really different for a lot of reasons. Um, the, and we're going to talk about those in a moment. Um, and I am once again going to use the union leader as a case study because um, the current editorial board there has impeccable timing. Um, because last Sunday, as I was going into a week where I knew I had to give this presentation, um, <clears throat> the union leader did something highly, highly unusual. It endorsed a Democratic candidate for president in the general election, excuse me. <clears throat> I'm sorry, pardon me. Um, it endorsed Joe Biden in the presidential election, um, which is unheard of, absolutely unheard of. You know, the union leader has always endorsed a Republican, except for 2016 when it endorsed Gary Johnson, who was the libertarian candidate. Um, and a lot of us who kind of follow politics, um, follow this corner of the political world, um, we just expected the union leader to sit out this year. You know, I, I certainly didn't expect them to endorse Trump. Um, they have made the, the, current, um, the current management, the current editorial writers there have been very transparent um, about the many issues they have um, with both him and his policies. Um, but for them to endorse Biden was, was pretty amazing. And so, you know, I went on Twitter and was like, oh my goodness, this is huge, this is huge, this is gonna change things. And then kind of took a step back and realized that because of the realities of the modern information ecosystem, I don't know if it's gonna be that big a deal. Um, and I really can't stress how different the modern ecosystem is. Um, and those changes are not necessarily good for civic life. So just a quick overview, um, these next couple slides are depressing, um, particularly for those of us who have worked in journalism and care very much about journalism, but um, I am gonna try and end on a bit of a high note. So um, there are fewer newspapers and fewer local news organizations than ever before. Um, and that's for a couple of big reasons. Um, digital, the rise of digital publishing disrupted the business model that has historically supported newspapers. And it also created more competition. So there was more competition for people's attention. Um, and that made it a lot harder and a lot less lucrative to, to run a newspaper. So family owners tended to sell their papers. They got out of the business, um, either because they were losing money or the next generation in the family didn't want to take over the paper, you know, for all the reasons that family businesses end. Um, and so they sold these newspapers to corporate chains and hedge funds. And, um, you know, there are some types of newspaper chains that are very well intentioned. 
Um, and then there are some that are just there to, to take them for everything they're worth and suck the life out of them. And so they've gutted newsrooms or closed the papers entirely. Um, oh, sorry, that should be industry-wide, sorry. Um, industry-wide, newsroom employment fell by more than 40% between 2007 and 2015. Um, we are still making sense of the absolute devastation that local news organizations are facing because of the economic fallout of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and there have been a number of efforts um, to try and support those local news organizations, um, but they're really just stopgap measures. And unfortunately, a, a lot of good local journalists have, have lost their jobs in the last couple of years, uh, or sorry, the last um, eight months. And all of this has terrible implications for access to high quality information about politics. So um, earlier this month, a political scientist named Eric Peterson released a new study. And the short version is that he found that that 40% reduction in uh, a newspapers or news organizations, newsroom staff meant 300 to 500 fewer political stories per year per paper. So that's huge. That's absolutely huge. And we're not talking about 300 to 500 fewer stories about Trump versus Biden or about the Republicans versus the Democrats in Congress or what's going on at the Supreme Court. We're talking about 300 to 500 fewer stories about state legislatures, town and city councils, ballot initiatives at the state level or in some places the county level, education policy, um, and the way that national decisions intersect with local communities. So when we think back to the Manchester Union leader and Naki Loeb and before her William Loeb, um, they were incredibly divisive figures. They had incredibly strong opinions, um, but they were able to articulate what they believed would be the impact of national policies on local communities. Um, and so we can really see that lack of that lack of grounding. You know, if there's nobody there to help you understand what um, what a bill that's going through Congress or stuck in Congress means for you in Boston or for you know me in the town I live in just over the border in New Hampshire, you know, what how are you going to make sense of policy that feels like it's happening really far away? We need those local news organizations to help us make sense of government and civic life. Um, and so as a result, people don't know what to believe. So it's human nature to want to know what's going on around us, to want to know what's going on in our communities. We crave information. Um, but if we don't have a local news organization, we have a lack of trust in the national press increasingly. And we have an over-reliance on social networks. And look, I love to go on Instagram and Facebook, um, see pictures of my friends, pets and kids. It's great for that, not a great place to get news. Um, and that's because those social networks are rife with mis and disinformation. Um, and all of this is an aspect of the type of political polarization that we face today. Um, so the, the reduction in the number of high quality locally owned local news organizations is, is drastically diminishing our ability to engage in civic life and our ability to have sensible debates across ideological differences. Um, so now that I've depressed you, um, I'm going to end on, um, I'm going to end on a high note. There are a few bright spots in the local information ecosystem um, that I do want to point out. Um, and then we will open it up for questions. So local public radio affiliates have been doing incredible, incredible work. Um, and not just on the air. They've got these really robust websites. Um, and there are a ton of examples of this. There are a host of digitally native startups 
that are like local newspapers without the printing press. And um, in an increasing number of cases, these digitally native startups, the people that run them are doing great journalism and making okay money. You know, they're not gonna get rich. It's not gonna be like, um, you know, being a Hearst or a Pulitzer in the you know, first part of the 20th century when you could become a billionaire running a newspaper, but you know, you'll probably be able to pay your mortgage. Um, there are an increasing number of nonprofit collaboratives that exist to support existing legacy news organizations in serving their communities. Um, and there are an increasing number of programs that support emerging journalists by sending them to communities that need them most. And one of those is Report for America. Um, but we need so, so much more if we're going to catch up um, to where we were even five or 10 years ago. Um, and I still don't think we fully understand the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and the economic fallout on the local news ecosystem. And that's really sad and troubling because this is a time when we need information about both our local communities and the broader world and an increasing number of people don't have high quality local news organizations to turn to and they don't know where else to go. So it's a big problem. All right, so with that, I'm going to end it. Um, here is my contact information. Uh, I respond to emails, I'm on Twitter, I have a website. Um, and yes, yeah, so if you have questions that you don't wanna ask in the room, you can get me that way. Um, but if you have questions now, I hope you bring them up. Mm -hmm. And thank you all so much for listening. Yeah, we definitely do have a few questions awesome. in the chat box. So um, the first one, is uh, from one of our alums down in DC who says, I'm curious what your perspective is on the current state of media in regards to partnership. Uh, it is, a, uh, is it in a good spot in your opinion? He states he lives in DC and I hear people on both sides of the political aisle complain about bias and unfairness in the media. So I think it depends on how we're defining the media. Um, because like I was saying, there is an ecosystem. So um, I, I, yeah, it depends on how we're defining the ecosystem. So I, I think that if you look at cable news, um, there's a pretty big divide um, ideologically. You know, if you just look at the news product on different cable news platforms on different days, um, it can, you know, it, it can just feel like you're in, in parallel universes. Um, as far as kind of the more mainstream general interest publications, I think they do okay. And there's been, um, there's been a fair amount of um, academic analysis, content analysis of major, particularly newspapers, New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal. Um, and their news coverage is, is pretty clean. You know, nobody's perfect. Um, and we can always learn and we can always try and do better. And we can always try and do a better job of covering more people more accurately. Um, but I think for the most part, um, from, a, from a political standpoint, they're, they're doing pretty well. The one critique that I do have of the digital versions of legacy newspapers like the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal, they need to do a better job of labeling their opinion content online. I think that causes a lot more confusion and a lot more distrust than we realize. Um, so if you pick up a print copy, you know, the front page is news and you kind of flip to a back section and there's all the opinion and you can tell that there are two different things that are kind of contributing to the public discourse in different ways. Online, it can be tricky, particularly if you're seeing something float by on Facebook or Twitter. So I think that would be one of my main critiques is if we could do a better job labeling what is opinion and what is verified originally reported news content, that might help a lot. Great, thank you. Um... Uh, one of the other questions we have is, how can you support news outlets uh, that support health and discourse? Oh, um, subscribe. Um, the, the, best, the best way that you can support 
news outlets is to give them your money. If you cannot, you know, and I know, um, you know, it's a tricky landscape right now financially for a lot of people, but, um, you know, subscribe. So I, um, I, like, as I said before, I live just over the border in New Hampshire. I subscribe to my local newspaper. Um, I get the digital edition. And then there's this other little local newspaper way up north that I love, I'm very fond of. I remember reading it as a kid and they were having a hard time earlier this year because of COVID. And so, you know, I bought a digital subscription even though I'm probably not gonna read it every day. Um, it wasn't that much money. You know, it's probably less than I give to public radio every month. Um, so, you know, sometimes that can be the best thing that you can do. Great. Uh, I think we have time for one more question too, uh, which is just basically the question that I see here is, um, and maybe not in print media, but also in journalism for local news stations that are being kind of owned by one entity. Is there, is, do you see the changing landscape of how media is being published by being one large person or one large entity owning a whole bunch of news stations and how that's getting out to people? Yeah, so TV news, that's a really good question. TV news is kind of its own thing. Um, and it is outside my area of expertise. That said, I am, I've been reading and trying to educate myself more about the impact of kind of big ideological chain owners like Sinclair Broadcasting. And I want to be careful with that. I know journalists who work for Sinclair stations and, you know, they're just doing good local news. So this is in no way, <clears throat> um, I am in no way speaking down to them or, or saying bad things about the work that they're doing. But I do know that um, the, the ideology of the owners of Sinclair seems to too often percolate into the news product in ways that isn't transparent. And I mean, there is, there is nothing wrong with having a point of view. There's nothing wrong with having an opinion. Um, but I do think that media owners need to be very careful to draw a clear line. And I, I fear that with some news organizations, particularly Sinclair, that's not always happening as it should. Well, great. Uh, I think that's our time for this evening. Um, Meg, I don't know if you had any final thoughts that you wanted to kind of say. Not at all. Just thank you all so much. Um, I know how busy everyone is right now, so I really appreciate it. Um, I think my one piece of advice is your kind of friendly neighborhood journalism professor. Um, just there's going to be a lot of mis and disinformation out there in the next couple of weeks around the election. Be smart about what you're reading and what you're sharing. Um, if you or someone in your life is at a total loss about where to go for news, um, the Associated Press is great. It's free. It's got an app. Put it on your phone. They've got some really good fact checks. And if you've got like an aunt or an uncle or a parent that is super confused, just send them there. And if you haven't voted already, vote. Great. Well, thank you so much, Professor Heckman. Uh, this was really informative. Uh, I can see in the chat, everyone is thanking you. So thank you very much. Uh, for the people that are still on, uh, I just want to let you know uh, we will be sending out a survey soon uh, to tell us how we did. Uh, we always love being able to hear from you to kind of make sure that we're getting the different programming right. And if there's other things that really sparked your interest in this that you want us to do again, please let us know. We always have to kind of put those events on. Uh, and just so you know, this event, this was recorded. So if you missed something, because you had to do a quick bathroom break or something during the thing, feel free to go to our YouTube channel in about two to three days and the recording will be there and you're more than welcome to kind of see it there. So again, thank you everyone for, for this evening and uh, have a great night. And as Meg said, if you haven't voted yet, please make sure to do so.